Hi, my name is Brian Lee. I'm a hobbyist woodworker in Richmond, Virginia. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I went about making a trestle style dining table using some methods and techniques for joinery you may not have seen before. And even if you have, I hope you find this video fun to watch. After dimensioning the lumber over the span of several days, the first part I tackled was the through mortise on the trestle legs using a template and guide bushing on my router. Since the bit I used wasn't long enough to cut the mortise from one side, I made the template to index from the same reference corner on the front and back of the same workpiece and cut the mortise halfway in from each side. All that's left is squaring up the corners left from the radius of the bit. The next joint is the bridle joint, which attaches the vertical member to the horizontal foot. To achieve what I call the lap portion of the joint, I use the table saw to make a series of cross cuts and then remove the additional waste with a hammer. On the vertical member, I bandsaw out most of the waste before using the table saw to make final adjustments. I make several small adjustments to the fence with the blade low until I'm happy with the fit before raising the blade to the final height. And since I was using PVA glue, this is the exact tolerance I wanted. Anything tighter and the moisture from the glue will cause the joint to swell and make assembly very difficult. To create an invisible glue line, we need to tune up the edge of the boards left by the joiner and also get rid of any convexity that may be present. To do this, we're gonna create a spring joint by taking a series of shavings starting at the middle of the board and with each successive pass, moving outwards from the center, thereby introducing a concavity on both glue edge surfaces. If you do this right, you should be able to see the joint line disappear with just one centrally applied clamp. Those little things I'm inserting are called biscuits, which help to ensure that the surfaces of the boards are as flush as possible during glue up. And while I said a spring joint can be closed with one clamp, feel free to use as many as needed to achieve a uniform glue squeeze out. Even with the biscuits and careful glue up, there's gonna be some differences in height between the boards, and so we need to flatten the table. There are a number of different ways to do this, including router sleds and taking the slab to a professional shop, but my number seven joiner makes quick work of this task, and it's fun to do. To get the tabletop smooth, I use a freshly sharpened and finely set smoothing plane. The next task is creating the tapered sliding dovetail joint, which attaches the tabletop to the upper part of the legs. I haven't seen any process videos online showing how to create this joint on this scale, so I made a more detailed separate video that you can check out. In short, to ensure the taper is uniform on the leg as it is in the slot, I attached a shim with the same 1 inch taper over its 33 inch length on one side of the leg as I run it through the router table. With that critical step done, any additional adjustment needed for fitting can then be done on the non-taper side.
with this type of joint, removing a tiny amount of wood really does change the fit in a uh, drastic way. At this point, with all the joinery complete, we can start to shape the individual pieces to transform it from a rectangular block of wood into something that more closely resembles a furniture component. The uh, burn marks from the machining process are easily removed with a finely tuned hand plane, and I'm attempting to show the quality of the surface that can be left from a sharp hand plane, which you really need to see and feel versus one that is sanded. At the time of making the table, I hadn't yet owned a lathe, so I'm using a tenon cutter to make these pegs, which will allow me to attach and detach the tabletop from the legs. It doesn't leave the cleanest surface, and so I'm using a compass to outline the large and small diameter on either end of the pegs as a guide to spoke shave to, in order to generate a consistent taper across all four pieces. Now, I know they make tapered reamers and matching tenon cutters, but given the short blanks of African blackwood that I had to work with, I had to think of a way to create a corresponding hole with sidewalls that would match this arbitrary taper that I had generated in these pegs. So I made a reamer using a saw plate and created the same taper using a file. I made a corresponding dowel with the same taper. And cut a central saw kerf in order to hold the reamer blade. The uh, block of wood is simply there to allow me to transfer more torque right at the work surface. And so with the tapered holes cut, we can permanently attach the batten to the undersurface of the table. The key thing here is to only glue the last several inches to allow the remainder of the table surface to expand and contract throughout the season. I decided to plug the dovetail opening with a plug made out of the same African blackwood as the pegs as a fun visual element and also to draw any curious eyes and fingers to this portion of the table to see how the surfaces are attached. My basement ceiling was just tall enough to allow me to place the stretcher upright like this as we start to generate the through tenon that will fit between the trestle legs. I've not seen this joint employed in any other piece of furniture other than a walnut trestle table built by George Nakashima. I'll call this joint an open tapered sliding dovetail key. And you can certainly cut this dovetail slot easily without the taper, but the problem is when it's assembled, the joint won't pull the shoulders of the tenon tight. The taper that we're introducing to this slot will not only make it an interesting visual feature, it really does stiffen up the joinery, which prevents the table from racking. To create the wedge, we need to just flatten what will become the back and show face of this blank. The black wood tears out easily, so I use a scraper plane to achieve this. The rough sides will be trimmed off with the aid of this zero clearance sled with the blade set at the same angle used to create the dovetail slot. 
Now this joint really deserves its own video explaining the process, but in a nutshell, you have to carefully measure and transfer the taper of the dovetail slot onto this blank. But because the blank is longer than the slot, you need to extrapolate the taper measurements onto the ends in order to figure out how much of the blank needs to overhang from the sled, which will then get trimmed off. We start conservatively from the line and expect the part to be too large. After a while, your eyes get good at estimating how much needs to be shaved off, but a surefire way to nail this fit is to attach blocking against the wedge while it's on the sled right before you make the cut. If you need to return and remove more off on either end, you can insert tape or spacers to pack out the part of the wedge and thereby be able to take micro shavings off the wedge where needed. But this is the exact fit we're looking for. I think in general, bow ties can be overdone, but there was a micro crack developing in this area, and so I reinforced it with this bow tie. The tenons on the bridle joint were made purposefully longer to allow any errors made when test fitting from the table saw to be erased at this stage. I decided to call this the tapered trestle table due to the number of tapered joints employed throughout its construction. The table was a fun build and my take on a table created by Japanese furniture maker Natsuki Ishitani. While seemingly simple in its appearance, it had a few challenges that required some creative problem solving, but the end results are tight fitting joints, a stable flat surface, and a piece of furniture that will hopefully last for many years. Thanks for watching.